Hello and welcome to the Bank of Middle East Leadership Series. Today we have with us Nash Mithani, Head of GSAC EMEA Private Banking and Head of Private Banking for the UAE at Standard Chartered Bank. Thank you for being with us today, Nash. Thank you for inviting. It's a pleasure. So um, let's start with how you think 2019 has been so far and what your projections are for the year. Thank you. So uh, uh, overall, the markets have done very well over the beginning of since beginning of 2019 and uh, equity markets as we saw in April as well there was a good rally as well overall 2.8 percent growth overall in the equity markets mm -hmm. vis-a-vis -vis year to date around 15 percent plus growth various markets so definitely the equity market rally we've seen this year furthermore on the fixed income space as well emerging market debt has done very well overall the fixed income markets is up by 4.2 percent year to date so we definitely seen good rally across both the asset class and that is the interesting question as you put what are the projections what do we see i would say there are two main factors that we need to look at in this one is seasonality and the event risk those are the two things that we need to look at mm -hmm. from a seasonality perspective you would have heard that the markets usually say sell in may and go away which is in a dialogue that we always say. So that is something that we need to look at, whether it's a time to take some sort of risk off the table with the rally that we've seen, take some profit and be on the sideline and watch what happens. That's where I think the event risk is very critical. And that is what we have to look at very, very much. Of course, we've seen that uh, the trade tensions have been escalating. So that is going to be a key factor, I think, to look at in the near term on how that plays out. The trade tensions are critical because it is a global economy, we want a growth will be trade related. So that's definitely important to look at and how that overall escalates. Would you say that is the biggest risk for you this year? That is one of the biggest risks. Okay. Of course, there are other risks as well in, in terms of overall looking at how the, uh, the economic results vis-a-vis the corporate America results come out mm -hmm. and I'm looking at the earnings season. Okay. So in terms of the equity space, Overall, our research is very clear that long term we are very positive with regional bias on China. On China equity, we are very bullish and we look at that as, as definitely growing mm -hmm. forward on a 12 plus month overall long term. Vis-a-vis, -vis, we are also bullish on U.S. equities, but it will depend a lot on the U.S. earnings seasons and how do we see the earnings yeah. coming out. We are less favorable on Japanese equities we don't see that being of our top picks. And then that is something that we are underweight overall on the equity if space. If you could explain like why. So on, on the Japanese equity, Japanese we, we don't see the economic growth coming through in Japan. Vis-a-vis, right. -vis, we see that the US economic growth doing very well. We've mm -hmm. seen the GDP growing last year. We see the non-farm payroll in Japan and so in US growing as well. So the economic activity is a lot more in US. And that's where we see the growth mm -hmm. coming in US. Vis-a-vis, China, which we say is the global factory of the world, we definitely see that coming through and, and that economic activity in China coming through as well. With, I'll put all this in a caveat saying that, of course, the trade tensions will be critical vis-a-vis -vis in, in terms of part of the economic cycle looking at the corporate America and the earning seasons. Those will be the critical in terms of the equity space. Mm. On the fixed income markets, again, we are bullish on emerging market USD bonds. Mm -hmm. specifically government bonds and emerging market, we are very bullish on that. On developed market bonds, we are not very bullish. We don't think that with the cycle that we're in on the credit cycle as well as the interest rate, we're not very bullish on that. But why, why are we bullish on emerging market debt? And, and, and I think that's a very valid question. And that brings me back to our FX predictions. And our, on the fixed, on the, sorry, foreign exchange, we believe there will be a sort of USD sort of no, sorry, my view. On the USD space, we think we underweight US dollars mm -hmm. against emerging market currencies. And we think the emerging market currencies will rally. Mm -hmm. If emerging market currencies will rally, the emerging market debt will be more in demand. Yeah. And that is where we see the fixed income as well as the emerging market debt growth. And that's why we think that the prices will come up on the emerging market debt. So that's where our view on yes. emerging okay, market. Okay, that's a very comprehensive projection in the market. <laughs> so but you're, you, you would say you're optimistic then? We are definitely the, yeah. optimistic, All yes. Right. So on that note, how big is the private banking sector in this region and where do you see untapped opportunities? Excellent. Taking all that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Again, a, a very important and very pertinent question. I believe the private bank 
sector in the region, especially Middle East and MENA, Middle East and North Africa, it's a huge opportunity. And I think all of us are definitely very excited. And let me tell you where my excitement is coming. Uh, so we've, we've been looking at the BCG report, mm -hmm. that's Boston Consultancy Group, and, and then their report. And I'll give you three anecdotal data from that, which, we, which very much excites us. So effectively, as you know, the, the personal wealth for any individual, ultra high net worth family or, or, or sort of in high net worth individuals is divided into two parts. We, what we call investable wealth and non-investable wealth. Mm -hmm. And what we have to look at is different regions. Different regions have different percentages in those two sort of uh, personal wealth management or personal wealth of individuals. What we've seen in developed markets, the non-investable asset weighs a lot higher than investable assets. So that's where we'll see that a lot of those clients will have sort of endowments, have pension funds, and have a lot mm -hmm. of that as part of their overall wealth compared to their free cash flow to invest. So that's where we see that. However, in Middle East is the highest percentage of investable assets compared to non-investable assets. Mm -hmm. So that excites us because saying that there is a, a larger corpus for us to look at, which is fantastic. On top of that, what they've seen is in 2017, the growth rate of personal wealth in Middle East has grown by more than 10%. And the is that higher than the global average? Global average. On top of it, the projection for the next five years, which is 2017 to 2022, mm -hmm. is 8 to 10%, which is again above average compared to the global GDP that we see across the global economies. Mm -hmm. So that excites us because that effectively what says that the growth rate of personal wealth is above average. And percentage of that, which is investable asset, is also a higher amount. So fantastic opportunity for a private bank to, lo to look at how do we help our clients in managing their assets. Mm -hmm. The third and final point, which is also very critical, I think, for us to look at is the number of affluent individuals in the Middle East and uh, North Africa region, that is the MENA region, it's growing by 14% or expected to grow by 14% from 2017 to 2022 to get to the 1.5 million individuals, if not. So that also tells us there's enough individuals out there and it's not going to be concentrated with a small mm -hmm. sort of pool of individuals, but there is quite a large. So that gives us a great opportunity for us to look at and tap into those markets. And this markets. is just GCC or the broader Middle East? This is Middle East and North Africa, and the North numbers Africa. that I said. Okay. Yeah. The earlier numbers I gave you, that was Middle Eastern in terms of the, the growth rates of the investable and non-investable. Yeah. So definitely huge opportunity for private bank here. Mm -hmm. But your second part of the question, if I may come to that, which was the untapped opportunities. Where yeah. do we see the opportunities coming? Of course, like every private bank client and every high net worth and ultra high net worth families, Traditional investments are critical. There's no two ways about that. Diversification, asset allocation, long-term asset growth, long-term diversification, and, and the goals to look at how do we look at the client's financial needs from mm -hmm. a core satellite approach where the core is for the long-term satellites are tactical investment ideas. That's definitely going to be there, and that is going to be what I would call the underpinning strategy for asset allocation and as well as the requirements from these clients. But the untapped opportunity in my view, and, and we've done our internal research and looked at it, that more than 50% of our clients in the Middle East are, are, have allocated about 10 to 25% of their allocations of investments mm -hmm. into what I call long-term sustainable investments. And that's the new exciting area that we are looking at where we're saying that in the future, what we see is our clients looking at moving away from their philanthropic activities and trying to look at alternatively on sustainable investments. Because to them... Define sustainable, is that yes. the, is that SRIs or... So sustainable investments is, is an investment which has an investment objective of to grow, yeah. but with a social angle to it. On impact. saying that impact, social yeah. impact. So effectively looking at that I definitely want to invest and I want my money to grow, mm -hmm. but I want to do it with a cause where mm -hmm. I can give back to the society, giving back to our society in Africa, in Middle East, and see how do we, the small businesses that want to grow there, but how do we help them mm -hmm. and how do we benefit from an investment perspective, but at the same time doing a long-term sustainable growth for those economies and those individuals where we're bringing them into, back into the workforce. Mm -hmm. 
So that, that impact investing is actually growing fantastically. And everybody's saying that rather than looking at a philanthropic activity, I look at it this where we know that there is an objective to grow, but everybody will grow together as well as the, the investment. So, so that's where we're seeing a huge shift. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I believe that is the untapped opportunity that where we can add value respectively with Standard Charter's core roots in Asia, Africa, and Middle East, which are the emerging market growth engines, and to see how we can add value to those economies and looking at those sustainable investments mm -hmm. and how do we bring that to our private banking clients. All right, you might have answered this question that I have right now, but okay. perhaps you could expand and make it slightly more specific. Sure. So from your conversations with your clients over the first quarter of the year, what are their main concerns this year and why? Yes. Excellent. Now, thank you for asking that question as well. Again, I'll, I'll go back to my first uh, answer, if I may. Mm -hmm. And this is going back, I think, that I'll, I'll put it in three buckets, if I may. Yeah. So definitely their concerns is the trade tensions. Yes. And how does that impact their portfolio? Their investments, yeah. And vis-a-vis -vis with the growth that they've seen, are we going to continue? Shall we continue or shall we take some, ta some risk off the table? Mm -hmm. Again, sell in me and go away. So, so those yeah. are sort of big things that they're looking at in saying that the trade tensions that's happening, how do we look at it? How do we evaluate? How do we look at it? And, and part two of that is that there's a lot of research that comes out there. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of literature on there with a lot of different banks giving a lot of different views. Mm -hmm. And that is where I think it's important for a bank like us to look at an unbiased view and try to filter it out and, and tell them, on based on the various views, what is the synopsis mm -hmm. and how do we look at it? So that is what we look at it in terms of, so the second problem, as I said, is the saying that is the, the, the issue of a lot of information and how do we sort of dissect that and how do we sort of condense that and actually filter that makes sense. So that's what I would call the second. The third one, and in my humble opinion, is, is, is as much as less of worrying but more of opportunistic view, what we've seen in the last couple of years that the, the, the growth rates in terms of businesses and various in Middle East and Africa have been a bit subdued. And I think there's a great opportunity now and the clients are feeling that definitely with the oil prices and the economic activities that are happening in our region, there's a lot of local investment and opportunities that they see coming back to the region. So that's how they're looking at it, if I may. Okay, so how then do family offices differ in different parts of this region and how how do you cater to them? Excellent. Thank you again. So the family offices, and, and again, I, I, I would like to break it up, the family office part in terms of in the region where they're looking at different parts for investments. And let me explain what I mean by that. So a lot of the family offices here, first we're looking at London as the core sort of booking center to mm -hmm. look at and, and looking at UK assets. And vis-a-vis -vis looking at real estate as part of the overall asset allocation. Mm -hmm. So looking at financial investments as well as real estate. And that is where if you look at the, those family offices are not looking at sort of only financial investment, but I mean looking at holistic approach where they want to look at sort of investable assets and non-investable assets and, and how do we combine that and look at it as a holistic approach. So that is what we've seen in, in the family offices looking at UK as an investment uh, base and how do we look at that. Vis-a-vis, -vis, we've seen a, a, an emerging trend. A lot of these family offices are also looking at sort of Singapore and Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that sort of that, that pull towards East is definitely coming. And vis-a-vis, -vis, that is where they're looking at in terms of the booking centers in Singapore and Hong Kong are more efficient, who work at a sort of round the clock. And they're saying that the advice that they get from those booking centers, the activity levels are much higher. And if you want access to Asia, then it's a natural tendency to go to Singapore or Hong Kong because that is where you're seeing the flows. So that is the trend that we're seeing on, on, on that side. So there is, as I said, there's both ends of the sort of family offices that we're seeing in terms of. Okay, so still on that topic of family offices, you mentioned this the last time we had a chat, which was last year. What challenges, what challenges do you typically see with the transition of wealth and businesses from parents to the next generation. Yes. This is something that you touched last year and yes. how has that sort of... Evolved. Yeah. Exactly. And, and the key word or the buzzword is the millennials. Millennials, yes. Millennials, as we say. And that's where we're seeing that there is a lot of change happening. And I think I'll put it into three buckets. And that's where all private banks need to look at in terms of how do we try to cater with this shift of mm -hmm. wealth going from one generation to the next generation. 
And number one is what I would call is digitizing. And digitally accessing our next generation is very critical for them because that is what they expect. The expectation is that at the touch point, they can see the entire portfolio. Mm -hmm. They can look at the research on their handset and they look at if they want to connect with their RMs and have a chat, they can have a chat rather than having a call to have a chat on secured sort of channels. So to me, that digitization is very critical. And, and that is where SCB has done a, a good step is what we're looking at is vis-a-vis -vis that our app, our SCB sort of private banking app has, has improvised a lot where you can have a lot of access to your portfolio, you can look at trends, you can look at research, mm -hmm. you can have a, a secured sort of chat and discuss idea flow. So that connectivity definitely happens from, from, from that perspective. Vis-a-vis, -vis, we're definitely looking at the fintech and how do we bring fintech sort of into the equation. Vis-a-vis, -vis, how do we digitize our account opening process? How do we digitize a lot of our procedures so that even if at a messaging and, 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 and that we can try to get approvals from our clients and connect with them and, and, and try to work forward. So to me, that's a big sort of shift that the private bank needs to sort of evolve and look mm -hmm. at, number one, two. Number two, in my view, is important is unbiased trusted advisor. And what I mean by that, and I think it relates a lot to Standard Charter is, as a bank, we don't have an asset management company. So what we say is that we want to bring the best asset manager for the asset class to the client. So if a client is, wants to invest in global equities, we will bring the best asset manager who has done very well, has a great historical past performance on global equities managing that, we'll bring that to the table to the client rather than saying that you have to use standard chartered asset manager for global equities because mm -hmm. that's what is part of the network. Yeah. So to me, that is going to be critical because what this new breed of investors are looking at is saying that give me an opportunity to evolve and, and check on what is in the market which makes sense. Mm -hmm. for the asset class and why are we choosing one over the other and why are we doing that. So that helps us in because we don't have our own asset management to become unbiased and showcase from an open architecture what is the best asset manager that we want to bring to us. So I think that is going to be critical as well as, as, as I think part two of this equation where we want to look at in, in terms of the next generation and the flow from the first sort of patriarch to the second. Mm -hmm. The third, and I think the most important view as well is for me is the holistic approach. And I touched upon that last time as well, yeah. is that a lot of these clients, they look at a bank as a one-stop shop. They want to look at something where we want to look at their personal wealth management as well as their corporate entity and how do we manage that. So they want a one point of touch where they can look at a holistic approach rather than just looking at wealth management only because they have a wider. Yeah. So they want us to look at their trade finance. They want us to look at their property financing. They want us to look at, we're connecting them with people in various parts of the world, especially China or suppliers in China or in Hong Kong and other businesses and to learn from them. So that is where I think it's going to become very critical in terms of trying to have this holistic approach and trying to connect them across the various touch points within the bank, but having a, a single point of touch from the client perspective. So he says, I don't want to go talk to 50 mm -hmm. people in the bank, but you are the sort of the window into the bank you are the sort of generalist. In a way, the fundamental of the last two points that you mentioned is personalization, basically. Exactly. Towards the, towards the client needs. Invest. Yeah. All right. Next question. <laughs> um, you mentioned digitization. Yes. And obviously, that is something that none of us can run away from. Yes. So how much have technology uh, and regulation impacted your operations? Excellent. So may maybe I'll put the regulation pit P yeah, put point first and yeah. then I'll come on to the technology. I think regulations are definitely a good thing. And, and I believe, and, and a lot of people, when they, they discuss, they talk about various banks and the cost of compliance. Yeah. Every time they've, they've asked me that, I said, like, do you guys understand what is the cost of non-compliance? Non you mentioned this last year as well. Yeah. yeah. Which is very critical because now we all of us have personal liability and all of mm -hmm. us have to ensure that we do the right thing. So to me, more than complying, it's a conduct issue. And conduct is very critical for me and for everyone in the bank, saying that if we want to behave with the right conduct, we have the right behavioral attributes to ensure that all of us are doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. 
And with that, if we look at it, I think with all this regulatory framework and the bar being raised, I think is only the right thing to do. And I think all of us also don't want to just meet the bare minimum. We want to be higher. We want to put a standard that is leading across the industry so that we ensure that all our staff and ourselves are be truly believing that we want to do the right thing here. So in that sense, I don't believe it's a hindrance. I think it's a good thing mm -hmm. because i rather get through that hurdle day one with the client and when it's done, it's done at a standard which is much better so that he doesn't have an ongoing situation and issues with that. So I think that way, I think the regulation is the right approach and I think we all need to definitely do the right thing here. So I think I wouldn't call that hindrance. It, it, it actually helps us in better understand the client. It actually helps us to understand the details of in terms of his source of wealth and as well mm -hmm. as his, his, his sort of income generation. So it is definitely the right thing. So that definitely is important and we are very focused on that. Technology is critical in, in, in terms of the growth ambitions that the private banks have and the industry has. If we don't have technologically advances, then I think we'll be left behind. Of course. And what we've seen is that we, we, as a bank, we've done very well in the private bank, definitely. So we've got this, what we call this Connect, SC Connect, and, and, and all these apps where a client wants to look at online and calls a uh, RM and says, I want to trade on something at a desk. The RM can put in the order and get it straight through execution. Can look at a lot of structured pricing to be done at his desktop rather than calling a desk and then saying the client, oh, let me call you back. I'll have to check and come back. So a lot mm -hmm. of that can be done sort of real time. So that has actually transformed the business as well. Because that gives the client a lot more as well on the job, on the time, uh, information. Uh, information as well as pricing. Vis-a-vis, yeah. -vis the, the also important with that is that because what we've done is now, since we've put it real time, what we've done is that we've provided three or four different providers who give us the pricing. Mm -hmm. So that way the client also knows that if he wants to trade with an underlying that is sort of issued by JP Morgan or by Standard Chartered, what is the price difference? So he can also get the best execution. So I think that has also improved quite significantly for us. So I think technology is the right way forward in my humble opinion. Okay, so taking all that we've discussed into well, together. So regulation, technology, the change of uh, preferences in investments. You mentioned sustainable investments. Sustainable um, investments. As well as, yeah, impact investments, as well as um, that transition between one generation to the next. All these things considered, how do you see private banking evolving in this region over the next five years? Okay, thank you. Uh, as I said, I think the prospects are very, very good. Private banking, I definitely think, is, is the only segment that I believe is going to definitely grow. Other segments will grow as well, but my bias will be all for our bank, because that's what I've done. And the reason is because I, I say it's a great blend of personalized touch, where you want to have a face-to-face -face meeting and have, want to have a personalized discussion with the client, mm -hmm. vis-a-vis -vis technological advances also being in that systems where they can do it online and have a look at it as well as having unbiased approach. So with all that, I think definitely private banking is definitely here to stay. And I definitely see growth prospects are very, very much positive vis-a-vis. -vis. Specifically in Middle East, with the, the growth projections that I gave you in 2017 yeah. and 2022, mm -hmm. there's definitely enough market share for enough players to be here and then actually to enjoy the benefits for that. So I definitely am very positive and excited. Okay, you mentioned marketplace. My last question. Yes. What is then your approach to growing Standard Chartered's private banking business in the region this year? Excellent. Now, thank you for asking that. And again, I'll, I'll divide that into three parts. So the, the, the firstly is that we are, as I said, we want to believe in holistic approach. And as a bank, our DNA is very much saying that we want to be a one-stop shop. Mm -hmm. So there is a great referral program that we have between us and the corporate and the commercial banking. So we look at cross fertilization and looking at how do we look at the referrals and build synergies across both. So that, I think that is one of the big sort of organic growth strategy that we have is looking at internally. So definitely we, we, we're looking at that. vis -a -vis, we are number two in terms of the growth strategies for us is that we're definitely looking at increasing our RM base and then looking at growing in terms of looking at adding more senior bankers and across growing in the region. So definitely that 
definitely helps us in terms of having a better, better, better marketing across the client base here. So that I think is the second very important. The third and, and the most critical for me is client referrals. Mm -hmm. And saying that looking at our existing client base and how do we get referrals from them for other clients is very critical. And, and that has also been growing. So definitely we're looking at how do we find different ways. And with this impact investing, every client that we invest definitely would like to bring their other sort of family and friends to that. So that Thank has helped there, us as yeah. well. And, and, and that is also a social cause. So that has been our strategy in terms of the growth. And I think that will we'll continue with that strategy. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Thank you very much. Thank That's you very much for your time. It's a pleasure. Thank you.